This Is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Professional athletes know it can be hard to keep their private lives private, depending on their sport and level of public admiration or scrutiny. But sometimes those private details can have a lasting impact on and off the court. Retired NBA player Jason Collins made news in 2013 when he made a very public announcement. He visited Connecticut earlier this month, Pride Month, to speak at a Connecticut Suns game. We spoke to him in studio while the NBA playoffs were still going on. Jason Collins, welcome to Where We Live. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself if, they're, um, if they haven't followed the NBA. Um, you are a California native. You have a twin, Jaron Collins, who also played for the NBA, and now he's assistant coach uh, for the Golden State Warriors. I guess we know who you're rooting for. Yes, definitely rooting for the Warriors, although as an NBA player, I'm supposed to be neutral. However, <laughs> when you have a twin brother who's sitting on the bench, <laughs> uh, I get to cheer for the Warriors. Um, so, yeah, we, we went to Stanford University. Uh, I graduated in 2001. We were McDonald's All-Americans in high school, so we had a, a pretty good <laughs> uh, basketball uh, career going into the pros. And I was drafted in 2001 to the uh, Houston Rockets and then traded on draft day to the New Jersey Nets. And my first two years in the NBA, we went to the NBA Finals. Unfortunately, I did not win. However, my brother won a ring a couple years ago, and it's looking like he's going to win another ring uh, so uh, the Collins twins are going to be two, four, five <laughs> in the NBA Finals. So yeah, so I, I, I you know played thirteen years, and my brother played ten years in the NBA, and so clearly I'm the better twin. <laughs> <laughs> Why basketball? What made you play, start playing the game as a kid? Well, we grew up playing every sport growing up. Uh, it was important for our parents to keep us out of the house and active, having twin boys. A lot of energy in the house, so they made sure that we played a lot of different sports and a lot of different activities. Uh, basketball, we gravitated towards naturally because of our height. Uh, it, being 5'3 in the third grade <laughs> helps. <laughs> and then, you know, by the time we're in the sixth grade, we are 6'3 and eighth grade 6'6. Six, six. And it was in the eighth grade that we made a, a conscious decision to focus on basketball because that was our greatest uh, or our best shot at uh, earning a Division I scholarship. So that was the goal was to earn a Division I scholarship. And then our parents challenged us and said, you know, don't just focus on basketball, but also on your on your studies. You want to be able to pick and choose which school. Say, what if you want to go to Harvard? You have to have the grades to go there. So we worked extremely hard in the classroom and on the basketball court and ultimately uh, ended up picking Stanford University. So not bad. <laughs> not a bad place to, to study, that's for sure. Uh, back in 2013, you gained a great deal of media attention mm -hmm. um, when you came out as a gay man in a piece that you wrote for Sports Illustrated. Um, at the time, you became the first active NBA player to come out. Um, you wrote in that article, and I'm going to quote here, when I was younger, I dated women. I even got engaged. I thought I had to live a certain way. I thought I needed to marry a woman and raise kids with her. I kept telling myself the sky was red, and I always knew it was blue. Why did you decide to come out in 2013? I had reached a point in my private life where I had told my friends and family. Um, I guess the biggest change for me was in uh, the lockout of 2011. Um, the end, like most people, when you're dealing with something in your private life, you might find outlets and find ways to channel that energy, that whatever you're going through. And for me, it was always basketball. But when I didn't have basketball, I was sitting on my couch and thinking, wow, is this going to be... How, is this how it's going to be the rest of my life where I'm sitting on a couch and uh, with my dog watching TV yet telling my friends and family that, you know, I'm out partying, I'm out dating, and by that time I had stopped dating women. I just, I got tired of living the lie. So I was working out with uh, a trainer of mine in Los Angeles, and I, I, I suspected that he was gay. Um, and then I looked him up online and saw that he did an It Gets Better video. And after seeing his video, I was encouraged to come out to him. I, his words really spoke to me. So it, it just starts with that one conversation that I had in, in 2011 to the point in 2013, I had told majority of my family, my friends, they all knew, and I had their love and support. So I was like, okay, I'm ready. And uh, there, were, there were definitely 
signs along the way that were encouraging signs. Uh, one was seeing the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern, uh, fine individuals for using homophobic language. So when I saw that uh, the NBA, the leadership, was setting a culture of respect and setting a culture of acceptance and making sure that if players did use homophobic language that it was going to be a very stiff penalty, $50,000 <laughs> minimum, <laughs> that, uh, okay, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll have their back. And then I saw uh, Doc Rivers did an interview um, for the, I think it was Boston Spirit uh, magazine, a local LGBT magazine. And when I was playing for the Boston Celtics, seeing my head coach do that interview encouraged me that, okay, like uh, if I come out to him, he'll have my back. So there, and then the, the last, I guess, s- straw that broke the camel's back was I was playing for the Washington Wizards in 2013. And in March of 2013, uh, Doma and Prop 8 were being argued at the Supreme Court. Here I was, a professional athlete, living less than three miles from the Supreme Court and not, and, and staying quiet. It killed me to stay quiet during that time. So I, I, I at that point, I made a conscious, I have to use my voice, and I was going to wait until the season was over, which is what I did. And then in that off season is when I sat down with Sports Illustrated. You talk about the support you got along the way when you made that decision to become public. It was a cover story on, uh, in Sports Illustrated in 2013. What happened after? And what kind of response did you get from teammates um, in a, a, a culture in the NBA at that time more homophobic than it is today? So um, I have to give a lot of credit to the professional athletes who came before me because they made the path easier for me. And when I ultimately made my announcement, Martina Navratilova, Billie Jean King, in basketball, John Amici came out. And because of them, my path was easier. So that when I did come out, I got respect um, and, and tweets uh, of support and respect from Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, Paul Pierce. Um, a lot of people reached out to me uh, who former teammates who had my cell phone number, Jerry Stackhouse, Darren Williams, um, spoke with Doc Rivers, and with nothing but words of support. Um, so a lot of that, though, is credit to to the, those uh, men who, uh, who supported me, but then also the people who came before me and made it easier. Um, and also getting a call, <laughs> back-to-back calls on that day from Oprah Winfrey and President Barack Obama. That was a pretty cool, <laughs> cool moment as well. Um, but everybody, you know, was, was with words of support, but then also the, the message of my actions would have a positive impact on someone else, someone else's life and someone that I might not ever meet. Um, and that's a really cool feeling to have that, you know, as individuals, I think that's what we all want to do is be able to have a positive impact on someone else's life. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. I'm speaking with retired NBA athlete Jason Collins. He's now an ambassador for NBA Cares. It's a program focused on social issues. Collins visited our studio earlier this month while in town for the Connecticut Sun's Pride Night. He came out as gay in 2013 in a cover story for Sports Illustrated. You write in that article that you didn't fit the stereotype of a gay man. When you mentioned some of these teammates who came out and supported you after the fact, were these the same people at one time that might have used oh, yeah. a type of you yeah. know, homophobic slur? Do you yeah. feel like it opened their eyes? Definitely. Definitely. I, I, I remember some people using some very homophobic language in the locker room. Yet some of those people, I don't think they really understood the words that they were using um, and the impact that those words have. And... Um, and my coming out gave them an opportunity to show, you know, who they truly were, whether they were that homophobic person, you know, that, or that, that person who uses homophobic language, or were they truly going to be an ally and, and someone who supports their teammate and has their, has their brother's back. And, uh, so yeah, I was surprised by some of the conversations I had. And one individual in particular was, uh, Tim Hardaway. Uh, when John Amici came out uh, a few years before I did, Tim had some very uh, homophobic uh, statements to make. And since from when John came out to when I came out, Tim has 
really grown as a human being. He has started out at one end of the spectrum to where he was, um, to where he is now as an ally of the community. And when I made my announcement, uh, he reached out to me, got my cell phone and number and gave me a call and just had nothing but words of support. And it was just really cool to see that because of John Amici coming out, that's it started a conversation and a change in Tim Hardaway. So where he started out as one way to where he is now. And, and that's the power of the coming out story is that it can force individuals to grow as human beings and evolve and, and get more education uh, on a subject and so that they see that, you know, LGBT people are just normal folks and normal people and uh, we, um, you know, want respect and acceptance just like every single, uh, everyone else. And Tim Hardaway, to his credit, uh, has grown as a human being. So, and I, I've, I've witnessed that, not with, not just with Tim, but with other individuals as well, who might have started off as someone very homophobic, but then now has become a very strong ally for the community. Mm-hmm. In that same article, you talk about your faith, um, and you talk about um, what it's like as a, a black man mm-hmm. to come out as gay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was asking you about um, you know, confronting the, the culture in the NBA, but do you feel like you're also helping just regular folks out there that aren't part of this big franchise, this big <laughs> basketball system? Yes, of course. Um, you, being a professional athlete, uh, you have a platform to touch many people's lives because sports cuts across so many different um, parts of our society. And uh, I remember, I'm going to name drop a little bit. <laughs> I remember having a conversation with uh, Joe Biden, and he said that my coming out, it was great for the LGBT community, but it was also great for the straight community as far as sometimes it's hard for two straight guys to have a conversation about LGBT issues. But when you put it in the context of sports, it's an easy way for them to kick off the conversation and say, hey, did you see that basketball player? Hey, did you see that soccer player? Hey, did you see that football player who came out? And it's and the only way that things are going to change is when people talk about it and have those conversations. So yes, I've, I've heard from folks and uh, how my coming out story or someone else's coming out story who has a, a public profile has helped had a, a positive impact on, on their lives. Oh, you made that uh, that very public announcement when you were 33 years old? Mm, 33, 34, yeah. <laughs> Do you wish that you had um, come out sooner? Yes, of course, but I wasn't ready. And, you know, I, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, your life is going to be exponentially better when you do make that announcement. But at the same time, I know that everybody is on their own path. And, you know, the only thing I, I can tell them is it's going to be a lot better to, when you don't have that stress in your life, that, that weight of feeling like is today going to be the day, the day that they figure it out, that, that I'm gay and walking around with that. When you set all that side, all when you set all that aside and and let go of that stress, and be able to just you know walk around, you know unfiltered and be able to be your true self in every, whether it's at your job or at your place of worship or wherever you go, not having that stress is just an incredible feeling. So your life is going to be exponentially better. You're going to find that there are people in the world ready to support you and accept you for who you are. Um, but at the same time, you know, you have to be ready uh, mentally, and especially for a professional athlete and one of the, um, obviously in the big four sports, um, you're going to get that label of being the gay athlete, and you might not want it. That was something that uh, John Amici talked to me about before I made the big public announcement. I'm very uh, grateful that, you know, he was sort of like a mentor to me and mentally preparing me, because up until that point, my label, I guess, you know, we all have labels thrown at us, <laughs> um, was uh, I was called the pro's pro or the you know, consummate professional or the hard worker. And John was like, okay, they're going to call you the gay athlete. They're going to call you the, the gay basketball, and you have to mentally prepare yourself for that. And at the end of the day, it's just one more label. And you can either choose to identify with it or not. And you know what? Yes, I am gay. And yes, I am an athlete. So, okay, you want to call me that? Sure. 
but that isn't just what makes me me. Uh, I, you know, have so much other um, uh, traits that make me who I am, and I celebrate each and every part of it, whether it's being African-American, whether it's being tall, extremely tall, and yes, being gay. So I I celebrate all that makes me unique and special, and I want everyone else to do that, uh, walk around with that feeling of, uh, you know, celebrate who you are. Jason Collins retired after 13 seasons in the NBA. In 2013, he made headlines after he came out as gay in a cover story of Sports Illustrated. When we come back from the break, we'll continue our conversations with Collins. This is where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. We're airing an interview with retired NBA athlete Jason Collins. He was the first active player in the league to come out as gay in 2013. I spoke with him a couple weeks ago when he visited the state to attend a Connecticut Suns event for LGBT Pride Month. We're speaking to you on a day where you were visiting, I believe, a a middle school in Connecticut uh, in the New London area. Um, You mentioned there's a lot more to you than just being someone open about being a gay man. (laughs) You talk about being genuine and that message to young people. Yeah. How do they take? How do they take that um, that great. that message? And they were great. What do they say to you? What are some of the the challenges that are they open about the challenges they face and and being open to say to their mother or their grandmother yeah. to their pastor? One of the kids uh, in the class actually um, uh, told me that he recently came out. So we uh, talked a little bit about what it was like, you know, coming to, coming out to his parents, and um, so yeah, kids today are just it's it's really cool to see the next generation, um, you know, able to talk about these issues at a young age, and able to um, ask questions <laughs> and talk about what you know what they're going through, um, and this young man. Um, you know, I'm just so proud of him to be at, at such a young age and living his authentic life uh, already in middle school. And, you know, it took me a long time uh, until my, you know, early 30s before I even said those words out loud. Um, so I, I, I'm encouraged and inspired by, by the kids and their questions today were great. You know, I didn't have to, you know, Pick out, you know, ask or prod or anybody, but they were they were ready with their questions, and they were they were all great, and uh, it's really inspiring to see. Uh, this is also the month uh, that many communities around this country celebrate LGBT Pride Month. Mm-hmm. What does this month mean to you, especially when we think about the challenges that remain? Yes, there's there's many challenges that remain. Um, you know, it's really cool to see. You know, being a, a retired athlete now, the sports community embracing um, pride in so many ways. At the end of the month, the NBA is going to march in the New York City Pride uh, Parade uh, for the second year. And and last year, uh, the NBA and WNBA became the first uh, of the major sports teams to march. And we had a float and we had our league executives, we had retired players, we had referees, we had employees. It's really cool to see. And then obviously, uh, what brings me here uh, in the Connecticut area is uh, with the Connecticut Sun uh, Pride game. But it's really cool to see um, sports communities, business communities um, support Pride. And then obviously with the uh, big marches ar- across the country in Washington, D.C., we have the Equality March. Um, there's you know marches in Los Angeles and there's so many uh, ways to demonstrate your support, whether you're a member of the community or just an ally of the community. 
just trying to build a culture of acceptance. And yes, we, we have a lot of work to do, like you said before. Um, and part of that is making sure that we have lawmakers who put in policies that will support the LGBT community and uh, making sure that we get those elected officials um, in there to, to do that. You've been speaking a lot about um, being positive and coming out with your story uh, to help people learn. I was just uh, looking at a report uh, where you had a powerful response to uh, another former NBA player, Amari Studemeyer, uh, who made some homophobic comments uh, to an Israeli media mm-hmm. outlet. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know why you decided to uh, confront this on Twitter and Did you get reaction from him after what he had said? Well, Amari is a former teammate of my brother's. So immediately when I saw what he had said, I reached out to my brother and I said, is this is this what you think Amari really stands for? And he's he said to me that Amari is that was probably Amari doing a horrible joke, bad joke. And. Sure enough, that was the case. Um, Amari did come out and apologize and said that that was a really horrible joke. However, you can't joke like that. You can't make stupid jokes, um, homophobic homophobic jokes, um, because the impact is that someone will pick that up and actually not realize that you're joking, not realize that you're um, that you don't truly feel that way. So. It's important to speak up against homophobia. It's important to use my voice. Uh, I remember what it was like being that closeted athlete and wanting to say something, wanting to use my voice, but afraid to. Now that I'm out, it's, uh, it's, you know, if somebody says something dumb, which is what Amari said, something uh, he shouldn't have said, uh, a really bad, in in his mind, a really bad joke. It's my. I feel like I have, I have to speak up. <laughs> I have to. Uh, I have to use my voice, and whether and especially in the sports community. Um, and it seems like um, there are still those individuals who um, use homophobic language in sports. And we're uh, at the NBA as an employee of the M- NBA. We have a, a rookie transition program. We have a seminar um, every summer with incoming uh, players into our league. And one of the uh, seminars is uh, with me and another uh, gentleman named Hudson Taylor from Athlete Ally Organization. And we talk to the players about their language. We talk to them about, yes, you might not intend for it to be received as a certain way, but the impact of your words, whether they be homophobic or sexist or racist or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, we're trying to eliminate that. Remind the guys that this is a workplace. Remind them that people are watching you. You have a public profile. So why not put out images uh, of yourself and language of yourself that is going to be positive? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if you don't, you're going to have uh, guys like me calling you out on it. <laughs> Kids are watching, yes. especially pro athletes. Definitely. Definitely. The next generation is definitely watching pro athletes. And that's why it's important that... You know, you, you, you keep all that, the, the homophobic jokes and the sexist jokes and all that, you know, just try to eliminate that from your vocabulary if you can. Uh, again, we talked about you going to schools, talking to students about being authentic, um, being open with who they are. Uh, do you think schools need to do a better job of educating children about how words hurt? I think it depends on the school. Uh, it depends on uh, the culture of the school. I look at it, you know, school is sort of like a team as like you, you set the culture, the principal, the teachers, the leaders of the school will set the culture for what, you know, what kind of environment you want to have at your school. And yes, it would be great <laughs> if your school is a place where um, you talk about these issues and you try to create an environment where everyone feels safe and accepted. And that's what it should be at a school. Kids should feel safe and be accepted, and um, there are great organizations who can help schools out there. It's going to be a plug for a great organization, uh, GLSEN uh, organization. You can go to glsen.org. Um, it's G L S E N. Um, it took me a long time to <laughs> get used to the right pronunciation for that acronym, but uh, 
but GLSEN is a great organization um, to help schools create safe spaces uh, and also educate their teachers, educate their students on how to become more um, LGBT friendly. Jason Collins is a retired NBA athlete, the first active NBA player to announce that he was gay, or he is gay, rather, an NBA CARES ambassador uh, in Connecticut to speak at a a Pride event, uh, the Connecticut Suns Pride Night game versus the Atlanta Dream. Jason Collins, such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. When we come back, we'll revisit our interview with Emmy Award-winning film director and producer John Scagliotti about his film, Before Homosexuals. It featured in the 30th Connecticut LGBT Film Festival earlier this month. This is where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Crashing waves, cawing gulls, the cutting scent of a falling tide all represent summer by the sea. On the next Where We Live, we'll take an in-depth look at these and other oceanic wonders with a team of scientists and marine experts. We'll hear from world-renowned explorer Robert Ballard, and we'll sit down with conservationist Jonathan White. His new book is called Tides, the Science and Spirit of the Ocean. Join us. That's tomorrow. Connecticut's longest-running film festival ended earlier this month. Now, one of the films featured was Before Homosexuals, a documentary that chronicles same-sex desire from ancient times to the modern world. John Scagliotti is director and producer of Before Homosexuals. His other work includes films like Before Stonewall, After Stonewall, and Dangerous Living, coming out in the developing world. We caught up with Scagliotti earlier in June. John, welcome to the show. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I wanted to talk about uh, your newest film and the, the opening shot. It's a beautiful scene where it's a scene of you walking around an island. Take us there. Why were you there? Well, it's a, a small island in Astapalia. And um, it was just by chance a friend of mine had been reading in Greek, uh, who, who, is, uh, who lives in Greece once in a while, and had told me about this new discovery. And it was a, a discovery of uh, some uh, graffiti of uh, two men uh, kind of calling out their love. They, they said it in slang in those days. And it was quite a find. It was 2,500 years ago. And um, it, it sort of put me in a position of thinking, well, this is a great opening for the film because I myself had been a, a, arrested for uh, an unnatural act or trying to solicit to commit an unnatural act in 1973 in Boston. And I thought, well, here is this sort of celebration of homosexuality 2,500 years ago, and here I am sort of kind of comparing these two periods of time. And so how did we get here? You know, how did that happen where in in Greece, uh, homosexuality was not perceived as something that you might arrest somebody for, and here in the uh, the United States, uh, uh, soliciting uh, in Boston was something that you were arrested for. So I thought that was a, a kind of a kind of an interesting time change in time, almost a time warp uh, in 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 the sense of how long. Uh, same sex has been going on in our world and how different societies have kind of had to deal with it. So that was the opening. But it was an amazing trip to Greece and, uh, and uh, this island. It was uh, quite, quite a trek because it was very hard to find uh, this uh, little piece of Greece video. There was not no one on this island. It was a very small island. And uh, so uh, I had to get a Greek fixer. They call them fixers in, in Greece, people who help uh, help you out and 
so a lot of cousins and relatives were called and little boats were taken. It was quite an adventure to get there. And this is a, a graffiti that people on the island um, know about and they it talk was about? found recently. Hmm. So before your documentary, take us back to how much um, is known about same-sex relationships in the, the ancient world. Well, that was the reason why I made uh, the documentary was when I was growing up, um, well, not growing up, but when I was growing up, I didn't even know there was such a thing as homosexuality. Then uh, all of a sudden, uh, the sort of period of the Stonewall happened uh, in the 60s, and it became a kind of interesting thing. But one of the things that I realized when we did before Stonewall was that there were no uh, you know, museums, archives that really kept very much material on uh, same sex. So um, we, when we did before Stonewall, in fact, uh, like the National Archives, any major archive never even had categories called homosexuality. So um, we had to go back and just interview people and ask them, you know, for the archives, things we wanted to show about gay life, we would say, you know, is do you have anything? And people would look under their beds, pull out boxes, shoe boxes, whatever. And that became our archive. And it, and then we went on later to make After Stonewall, and then all of a sudden there was a real archive because major things started happening after Stonewall. Um, so, but still, very little about the ancient times. It wasn't, and the reason why was because even in America after Stonewall, there was a tremendous amount of um, activity going on, but it hadn't yet brought forth the results. For example, in um, education, you could easily be fired if you were a professor and you came out in, um, in, a, in a university, especially a state university. So it, was, it took much uh, courage and a lot of people like the uh, things like uh, organizations that got together at universities that, that, that fought for LGBT people uh, to get tenure and then research grants. And then all of a sudden we saw in the gay 90s, what I call the gay 90s, a huge explosion of things happened and a lot of things changed. And a lot of professors and teachers and anthropologists and people who were gay were able to actually say, I think some of this stuff is important to find and look for. A lot of it was there. It's just that it was hidden away or censored. And so by having this huge force finally released, people could go and get material. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the academics. Um, you hear from a lot of them in your documentary before homosexuals. Um, they looked at the Bible, and uh, one clip that we wanted to play, um, you spoke with Professor James Saslow, where he's talking about uh, Michelangelo's famous sculpture of David. Michelangelo's David is a titanic work of art in the Renaissance as an artistic culture. Now, what it means to me personally, he is David, not only the killer of Goliath, but David, the lover of Jonathan. David, who says, when Jonathan dies, your love to me was more beautiful than that of women. Again, that clip is from the documentary Before Homosexuality. A filmmaker, director, producer, John Scagliotti is on the phone with us here on, on Where We Live. Uh, that account might be surprising to some uh, to hear that this uh, biblical hero, David, um, there are interpretations that he was uh, gay. Well, you know, our film is about same sex and same sex love and same sex desires. So, um, you know, you didn't have terms like gay a lot of a lot of places uh you know like homosexual itself that's the point behind the film the word homosexual was a sort of scientific term that we or gay people actually were part of calling ourselves that in 1867 so um the concept of what gay uh or or, or same sex is is being reinterpreted as we go, and, and it's not only a question of finding material, it's re-looking at material and seeing it in a different way. I think uh, 
for James Saslow, the idea of these passages, which are very strong and very homoerotic, would indicate to you, if you just looked at it and you, and you just said whatever, you would say these two men were madly in love with each other. Uh, there's this point in the Bible where, you know, he says, uh, you know, he wants to make a covenant. Now, a covenant is a marriage and uh, in, in many places. So, you know, they basically got married. Uh, he, he, he then disrobes in the Bible um, and uh, walks over, you know, and gives himself to uh, a David. Um, and so, you know, you can reinterpret that, but a lot of people did in the Renaissance. There are many paintings of David and, and I mean, uh, David and and Jonathan become sort of kind of uh, sort of gayish kind of figures if you look at the Renaissance and start seeing how they look at each other in pictures and all that. So a lot of uh, gay people in the Renaissance obviously started painting some of these stories based on what they thought they meant. So it's 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 more, um, you know, who knows if the Bible is literal anyway, so it's sort of like reinterpretations mm. of the Bible. So going from Greece to uh, ancient Rome, um, if we study uh, Roman culture, same-sex relationships were accept acceptable, part of the dominant male cu culture, but not much was known about women who had relationships with women. Why is that? Well, you know, well, A, sexism. B, uh, you know, I mean, the story about women is, is has hardly been told, is, is my feeling. I mean, uh, it's just a, a history that is bubbling up, the, the, especially ancient as well as... Uh, uh, even present, uh, you know, are the, you know, women who have who've done amazing things all over the world. Their stories are still to be told. Is is my feeling. Um, but um, I remember when I started looking at these books, these professors started. There was no question that they were starting them off by saying, uh, "Well, this is one of the first books about homosexuality in Greece or whatever." You know, nothing nothing went on about women, so we can't really uh, say there was. And so this wonderful professor named uh, Bernadette Bruton, she went out and, uh, you know, she didn't believe it. You know, and she started looking, researching, and doing and things. Uh, uh, she got a MacArthur Genius Grant, uh, and she was like a, a brilliant person who went out and found stuff. And one of the wonderful things she found were these uh, uh, ancient Roman, les what we call lesbian love spells, but they are... Uh, they used to do love spells. You'd go to the temple and, let's say, you had a crush on so-and-so. You could do a spell on them, and hopefully they would come running to your arms. And some of these were found, and most of them were hetero. Uh, many of them were, oh, I guess all of them, and, and those in the early days were heterosexual. And she kind of had a sneaky suspicion that if she went back in the room somewhere, and she would begin finding these lead tablets that showed... Uh, women to women sort of uh, doing love spells and this and um, and so there they were and that was one of her great finds and, and we certainly enjoyed putting that in the film it's one of my favorite parts in the film is it only because it's sort of like not only is it about women but it's you know it's it's just a kind of a beautiful kind of concept of uh, wishing this person and putting a spell on someone through the gods uh, to fall in love with you. Mm. Your documentary takes you all over the world. We have to mention the Kama Sutra. Um, you spoke with Ruth Vanita, author of Same-Sex Love in India. Um, she says that there's more to the Kama Sutra than just the heterosexualized version. Let's hear it. Even the glossy coffee table kind of versions of the Kama Sutra that float around in the West, they're all heterosexualized. You don't have this uh, stuff in it. So people don't know this about the tradition. There's a chapter in the Kama Sutra. It divides people into men who desire women and men who desire other men. And then goes on to give a very detailed description of oral sex, like sucking a mango and so on. Quite non-judgmental and even quite playful. And what else did you learn about same-sex love in India, John? Well, um, you know, Ruth, one of the things about our, our film is that it's just sort of like it touches on a lot of things all around the world. And, um, you know, Ruth has done some amazing uh, books and, and articles about same sex in India. So sometimes I get a little confused myself in the terms of what am I 
what am I uh, uh, what am I learning uh, from my film or you know from all the other material that I've researched because we've done tons and tons of research. But uh, the same sex uh, has been a an incredible um, journey and is part of the Indian culture. Um, as, as we open it up with a, a, a young activist lawyer who says it's in our sculptures, it's in our poetry, it's in it's in our art. It's just everywhere around them is homosexuality uh, or same sex. And um, so a lot of the temples that we went to, you know, they were these wonderful sort of depictions of a very sexual, of all kinds of sex, but it includes um, same sex, too. I mean, there's heterosex, same sex, I mean, all, oh my God, these temples are really beautiful, and um, so sex was taken as a much more fluid and much more interesting sort of, you know, right out there in your, in your, in your world kind of sensibility in India uh, in the past. Uh, you know, colonial, c- colonies, when countries became colonies, the uh, Western influence of England and the Puritans and all that sort of made it kind of stop that. But yet, you know, they did, luckily they didn't tear down the temples and they didn't destroy everything. A lot of places they did destroy same-sex sort of uh, materials. But, uh, and, you know, so India had this material. Also, India has, uh, and we mentioned this uh, when we talk about uh, gender, because gender is very fluid throughout the uh, world, um, has uh, hijas, which were um, sort of, uh, there were in some cultures the ability for like effeminate boys and men to live out lives as women. And uh, and so they became a major force in India um, at, at the time. In the early days, a very highly respected uh, a, a group of people, and sort of as, as uh, our interviewee says, that they were um, the keeper of the harems. They were sort of in charge of a lot of things that were taking place in the sort of wealthy parts of uh, India uh, pre-colonial days. So there is quite a past that's pretty amazing. It, it's kind of that way all over the world, except in Western culture. You know, even pre-West, uh, pre-Christian, pre, you know, Leviticus, there was quite a bit of fluidity and sexuality. Uh, but around the rest of the world, there was a lot more fluidity uh, in sexuality, and and uh, you know, not every, and even in marriage rules. And one of the things you learn when you start researching and finally getting into sex and and gender and issues like that 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 the world is not uh, you know three quarters of the world is not following the uh, Bible or the you know it, it's just you know there's a lot of there's a lot of fluidity out, out there I, I shouldn't say three quarters because of the, you know the Bible does have a major impact on a lot of other religions too. So, uh, but but there was a tremendous amount of fluidity in ancient times when it came to sexuality. I'm not saying that you know homosexuals ruled the world and there was no way, uh, but they had in some places a much more uh, uh, open situation, were a little safer, and uh, and but one of the things that happened is that the seesaws would happen. You would see things happen. They stop it. New rules would be made and changes would happen. And that's our history. That's what's wonderful about just going back. You realize that even today when there's such uh, flexibility and such uh, openness for LGBT people, that could come crashing down uh, too. And, you know, you, you sort of have to understand that these things come in cycles and uh, I, I only bring you back to what did we call Weimar Germany where in Germany in the uh, 20s um, gay people pretty much had the run of the place I mean there were tons of clubs tons of uh, you know you would never even know that you were in a society that that uh, 10 years later would have concentration camps and would have homosexuals being lined up and shot and killed in, in workforces so uh, and the materials that they had created and saved were destroyed uh, you know one of the things that I was because I'm into film 
our, our first gay film was burnt by the Nazis. It was a German film, and we, in, before Stonewall, were lucky to find the one copy that some brave souls uh, saved, and uh, and there it was. So, you know, um, they actually did come and try to destroy anything about gay and lesbian life, uh, culturally speaking, the Germans did it, and but yet people were wise enough to like hide stuff, and and we were able to find materials, and even, um, but in Germany it was horrible until the 60s, mm-hmm. so you had like 40 years of just pure, uh, really uh, anti-gay sort of sensibility in Germany, even after the war, after liberating the camps, um, the only people who were, you know, they, they were looking for criminals, and they considered uh, homosexuals criminals. So gay uh, people had to stay in jail after the war in the, in, uh, when they liberated the camps. And, and, John, we just have a minute before we go to break. Again, um, this is where we live. I'm Lucy uh We're speaking with John Scagliotti, who um, his new documentary, Before Homosexuals, the prequel to Before Stonewall, we're looking back at, at same-sex relationships uh, thousands of years ago in many different countries. It's uh, part of the work uh, that John has done in his new documentary. Um, you opened the documentary, uh, John, uh, talking about when you were arrested in Boston um, as a gay man. You know, how, what was it like for you? to go through this? I mean, you've been making films about LGBT history uh, for some time, but to, to understand and to see that same-sex relationships at, at one point in time were accepted in these countries and, and to see that seesaw, as you mentioned, how did it make you feel personally? Well, it, you know, um, well, obviously I was a, a very scared as a kid. Um, when Stonewall happened, you know, it, it did a, an awakening for many of us uh, who were in that period of time? This was in America. You needed to get back to America at the time. It was the uh, 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 '60s, and part, you know, '69, '60, uh, the anti-war movement. All these things were happening. So we already had this massive sort of anti-authoritarian, anti-countercultural uh, thing going on, where um, all of a sudden. The Stonewall thing, which I think is the reason why there was the Stonewall rights in the first place, because it was a lot of uh, folks who were part of that counterculture living uh, in New York City, and the, and the Stonewall was a favorite place for, you know, drag queens and for uh, hustlers and sort of kind of people who were living the what we used to call in the life. And uh, so when it happened for me, it was very liberating. It was very exciting to all of a sudden uh, realize that we had, there were others like me, and so I was a, an activist from day one, from the birth of that moment. John Scagliotti is director and producer of the new film Before Homosexuals, which featured at the 30th Connecticut LGBT Film Festival. Our show is produced by Lydia Brown and Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. WMPR's executive producer is Katie Talarski. You can check out WMPR.org slash where we live for more about the show. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.